Guten Morgen! War in Ukraine is on all the screens right now. And for those of us fortunate enough to be watching from afar, it's been a bit of an emotional ride. Helicopters shot down, marches through occupied towns, families being split, perhaps saying goodbye for the last time, children singing in bomb shelters, masses of refugees, and not all of them treated equally. Cold geopolitics, journalists being shot at, DIY bomb defusing, a farmer stealing a tank, an Irishman driving through Russian embassy gates, media outlets closing, devastation, evacuation, and more devastation. And all of it made a little heavier by a fear that we might be just watching the prelude to something much worse. And then... Breaking news, Russia has attacked a civilian nuclear power plant. This is a first in human history. Dice que puede verse humo salir de esta planta. An unfolding nuclear disaster. Dix fois plus puissante uh, potentiellement que Chernobyl. Since that night, talk of radiation has been a centerpiece of our wartime information diet. But we've been fed very few nuclear engineers or health physicists and a lot of pundits, politicians, and political scientists. This is our worst nightmare come true. If it goes offline, if we have nuclear meltdown among six reactors, this is going to be worse than Chernobyl. If there will be a breakdown, it's the end of everything. The end of Europe. It's the evacuation of Europe. In the face of all these apocalyptic descriptions from non-experts, I called up DJ Leclerc, aka The Rad Guy, TikTok's most popular radiation safety specialist whose 9 to 5 job is in nuclear accident preparedness. I asked DJ what mistakes he's been seeing in the coverage so far. Big one is when people try to compare the VVR reactors at Zaporizhia to Chernobyl. There's basically two main reasons why this couldn't be Chernobyl. Chernobyl was not an inherently safe reactor. If temperature increases in the RBMK type reactor, that causes your power to increase, which causes temperature to increase, which then causes power to increase. So it's a positive feedback loop, and that's the reason why the Chernobyl disaster happened. If temperature increases in a VVER reactor, it actually causes the power to go down. And that's a very good thing to happen in any reactor. And it's actually the international standard. That other reason why the containment, the RBMK reactor didn't have a containment to capture that accident, but the VVER reactor does have a greater than a meter and a half thick wall containment Another big advantage of having that containment is it is able to withstand missile hazards. It can withstand a aircraft to smash in right into it. Like many people, my early experiences with nuclear safety come from films and television shows with unlikable yet headstrong characters who in the first five minutes never fail to say something like, RBMK reactor cores don't explode. So I had to find out what would happen if the impossible did happen and an explosion exposed the reactor core like it did in Chernobyl. So I called up one of the world's leading experts on the health impacts of the Chernobyl disaster, Dr. Geraldine Thomas, Chair of Molecular Pathology at Imperial College London and the Director of the Chernobyl Tissue Bank. I asked her how many people have been killed by radiation at Chernobyl. You have 28 people who died as a direct result of being exposed to very high levels of radiation, and those were the emergency responders who died of acute radiation syndrome. Then if you look at the population effects, we know there have been 15 cases of thyroid cancer that have subsequently died from 1986 till fairly currently. We've no evidence of, of an increase in cancer in anything else. We would still expect to see an increase in the general level of thyroid cancer. In about 50 years, we might see... 16,000 extra thyroid cancer cases. But remember, with a mortality rate of 1%, that means only 160 deaths. And that's probably a worst case scenario. People think that radiation doses to an individual from a nuclear power plant accident are very high. Now, obviously those who were working actually in the plant as emergency responders did have high doses because that core was unshielded. But further away from the plant, those doses decreased very, very rapidly. About six million people who were living in the contaminated area around the plant over a period of 25, 30 years got the equivalent of one CT scan, so 10 millisieverts. 
The numbers on excess cancers are definitely debated, but the UN Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation puts the death toll for Chernobyl at under 100. If those numbers don't rhyme at all with the image you have in your head of what happened at Chernobyl, I know for me personally, the first time I heard them, I was very skeptical, then I suggest checking out Chris's full interview with Dr. Thomas over on the Decouple podcast. It gets into the science behind those numbers. There's a link in the description. So that's the story for the people living around around Chernobyl, but what about this radioactive cloud that went all over Europe? In case of Chernobyl, the radioactive cloud and then the fallout affected places as far out as Ireland. Europe is on the brim of a new nuclear catastrophe. If they are damaged, there will be a leak of a radiation cloud and only the wind knows where this cloud goes. It didn't threaten Europe. What happened was that you had an explosion in a reactor that had no containment around it. And that meant that the volatile isotopes will be thrown up into the atmosphere. And that's why a lot of Europe had some contamination. To say there was lots of contamination and that there are health effects is just not true. The only health effect that came from Chernobyl was in the local vicinities. You can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't smell it. So you can understand why people are scared of things like that. But don't forget, we're surrounded by radiation. You can't avoid radiation living on this planet. Everything you eat has got a small amount of radiation in it. Lying next to your partner at night, they're irradiating you because their body contains radioactive isotopes. We've developed as a species over a long period of time being exposed to radiation, so it's perhaps not surprising that low doses of it really don't do us any harm. The general takeaway here is that when people warn of a disaster 10 times that of Chernobyl, just remember that that's already happening. <laughs> what I mean by that is that in just two weeks of war, the besieged city of Mariupol alone has counted more than 10 times the deaths of Chernobyl. Returning to the safety of the plants themselves, if it's true that the inherent safety of the VVR reactor is such that another Chernobyl is off the table, what happens if we move down the nuclear accident index scale one notch to Fukushima? We'll start with the opinion of former CNN anchor and science correspondent Miles O'Brien, who for some reason was brought in as an interviewee to answer this question on PBS. This is where you get into the nightmare scenario. There are 15 operative reactors there, and if you cut off power to one of them, you could march down the road to a Fukushima scenario. They had a 40-foot wall of water strike the reactor plant and disable all of the stuff. In the case of what's going on here, it would have to be very deliberate. A lot of systems would specifically have to be manipulated. You have to know what you're doing in order to cause anything to happen anywhere similar <laughs> to a, a Fukushima accident. Even if we were to have a Fukushima type event, it's good to know that the radiation caused no measurable health effects in the populations around the nuclear plant. Absolutely no deaths as a result of Fukushima from radiation and at the doses that we know people were exposed to would not expect to be able to see an effect on the population. The 19,000 plus deaths in Japan were because of the Tohoku earthquake, the fourth largest ever recorded, and the tsunami that it provoked. According again to the UN Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, the deaths that happened around the Fukushima power plant had to do primarily with the panicked evacuation from the plant and not from radiation. So it is at best irresponsible to yell Fukushima in a crowded theater, especially a crowded theater of war. It could cause people who are otherwise safe to flee into a world of bullets and bombs. But the danger of bad information goes far beyond Ukraine. For those of us living in NATO countries, for example, we're being exposed to daily appeals to our nuclear fear in an attempt to convince us to support a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Former president of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko, joins us now. We need non-flying zone, definitely, and we can close the airspace above the nuclear power station because nuclear contamination don't have any border. It is no longer a Ukrainian issue. It is a possible threat for the whole of Europe and even the world. Closing the Ukrainian sky is the number one task to avoid this catastrophe because radiation has no nationality and stops at no borders.
It is fully understandable that the leadership of a nation under attack would appeal to any argument it can, truthful or not, to get support in that situation. But the rest of us have to be discerning. Because while a nuclear power plant could never physically become a nuclear bomb, a no-fly zone could take us there, as explained by the head of NATO himself. And of course, the only way to implement a no-fly zone is to send NATO planes, fighter planes, into Ukrainian air airspace and then impose that no-fly zone by shooting down Russian planes. Something that could end in a full-fledged war in Europe. A recent poll here in Canada asked respondents two questions. Number one, do you believe that a no-fly zone over Ukraine could lead to nuclear war? And number two, do you think a no-fly zone should be imposed over Ukraine by NATO? 60% of those who said they do believe that a no-fly zone could lead to nuclear war also said that they want NATO to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine. If you or someone you know is in that 60%, I'm putting a link down in the description to an animation by our friends over at Kurskasat explaining what happens when a modern nuclear weapon is detonated in a city. It's beyond the scope of this particular program to propose the best way to put an end to this dreadful invasion. But what we can say from here is that we don't believe that distorted fears of another Fukushima should lead us into another Hiroshima. In conclusion, war is hell. And the best ending that I can see from here would be for Russian soldiers to tell their commanders to stuff it and turn around and go home. But don't take it from me, take it from this captured Russian soldier. Вам, наверное, тяжело, да, пойти против воли своего командира и так далее. Ну, ну реально, здесь происходит геноцид. Россия, ну, никак здесь не победителем не будет при любом раскладе. Мы завоюем территорию. Кто людей-то завоюет? Мы как эту территорию будем вообще держать-то в руках? Просто с нами никто разговаривать не будет. И это опять будет правильно. И русский человек будет, выходя за дверь за свою, да, ему будет стыдно говорить, что он русский, потому что он будет за трещину всегда получать, за то, что мы сейчас сделали. Поэтому я вас очень прошу, как, пока есть возможность, остановитесь просто.